And as I said, we're going to look at that, that passage from Romans chapter 8 today, but I thought we'd start looking at that passage from Romans chapter 8 by not looking at Romans chapter 8. Huh? That sounds like a good idea, you think? Okay. We're actually going to first go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. Put it up there for us, Jim. We're going to hop right into it here today, uh, because this is the Apostle Paul, same guy who wrote Romans what did I do? It's not there, is it? I don't, see it I don't think I put it out. That's my fault. Okay, so I will read it to you, and, and then that'll be the case. But um, it, the same guy who wrote Romans is the same guy who wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and, and he writes this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. He says we must all appear before the judgment seat so we must go before the judge. So what, what, what Paul puts together here for us is this image uh, of us uh, in a courtroom, and we're standing before the judge. This is one of our go-to verses within our faith. When we want to sound all theological, and we want to start talking about <gasps> the judgment day, or the great judgment, and you know it's important because as Christians over the years, we've put a the in front of it. We do it with all the big stuff. You have the creation, the fall, the flood, the, 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 what, the, the exodus, the exile, the temptation, right? The important stuff. Today, the judgment day or the great judgment and, and and the verse I read to you is just one of many verses within scripture that informs our knowledge of what the the, the day of judgment will be about but uh, the great judgment it's it will take place at the end of all things and as the verse I read to you indicates all people no matter who they were on this earth no matter where they live no matter what religion they were on this earth all people will stand before the judgment throne of God God. And as the verse said, that they will receive judgment for the things they have done while in the body. Things we do on this earth. The good and the bad. And we all have the bad, right? We all have the sin. We all face that, right? Um, and we've all got those things. It will be laid bare before God as our judge as we stand there before Him face to face. And we will all be judged. This is perhaps an uncomfortable truth that we know from our faith that God has revealed to us in the scriptures that all people will stand in judgment before God. And those who don't know Jesus, those who don't follow Jesus, they're the ones who should be the most afraid of this, right? For reasons we'll see here in a little while. But they don't believe in Jesus. They don't trust in any of this God stuff, so they don't pay it any mind. They don't even think about this. Uh, it's not a problem to them. I think that'll change very quickly at the end of all things. Uh, but they're not concerned about this. But those who follow Jesus, we have no reason to fear the great judgment. Again, for reasons we'll get to in a little while. But I think sometimes we're the ones who are scared of it the most, aren't we? I mean, to be clear, standing face to face with God, well, every wrong thing I've ever done, every rebellion against Him I've ever done, it's just there out before me. That, that does not sound like a pleasant experience to me. Does it sound like a pleasant experience to you? No, not at all. Because we know of our guilt. Uh, we, we, we don't comprehend the, the vastness of it, though, and, and, but we will in that moment. So it's not a pleasant experience, but it's an experience, while not pleasant, that we know the outcome. It's been made aware of us, and it's going to be a, a good outcome for those of us who follow Jesus. So if you follow Jesus, Jesus, you don't need to be afraid of the great judgment. But I think it is natural that any time we stand before a judge of any kind, uh, we, we have a little bit of fear, right? I mean, if you're hauled into the local district judge on a parking violation, even when you're in front of him, you got a little bit of jitters. You might stutter. You, you might uh, jumble your words a little bit. So when we look to, to the great judgment, and, and the judge is going to be uh, the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe, our God, well, of course there's going to be some fear there. I think Paul understands this as he writes for us in Romans chapter 8. He's going to say some things, and he doesn't tackle this idea of judgment day or the great judgment directly. It's kind of an abstract idea he has out there uh, as we read in Romans chapter 8. But he's going to, to address it from a way that's actually encouraging for, uh, for followers of Jesus Christ. Because he seems to understand, hey, there's probably some fear out there about this. 
Before we go there, let's look a little bit at what, what Paul has already said in Romans. And we're not going to cover all of it because he's said a lot. But some of the stuff we've talked about, we, we've seen how, how Paul has already said, look, even though we continue to struggle with sin, oh, we battle against sin, we are dead to sin. Sin is dead to us and we live in Christ. Christ has given us a new life. And therefore, earlier in chapter 8, which is something we didn't cover, Paul has gone through a series of steps where he said, God has chosen you. And if he has chosen you, he has called you to him. And if he has called you to him, he has justified you. Now, justify. That, that's a big church word we use, isn't it? Uh, what does it mean to be justified? Well, it means that uh, he has already served justice for the wrongs you have committed. Those who follow Jesus, justice has been served. So you might stand before God at the last judgment on judgment day for all of your sins, but the punishment has already happened. You're not going to be punished on judgment day because you've already been justified by God himself. He has already served justice. And Paul writes in verse 32 of our text today that God did that by giving up his own son, right? That's how God justified us. And this is the gospel we celebrate all the time, right? That those who follow the son, those who follow Jesus will be justified. We will be saved by grace through faith alone. Justice has already been paid. Jesus paid for it on the cross cross. So Paul talks about um, what we call the great judgment, but it's not a scary thing for, for those who are Christians. For followers of Christ, it's actually a beautiful thing. And as Paul writes in Romans 8, you kind of see abstractly that he is writing about this courtroom scene and God's there sitting on the judge's bench and we're about ready to have a trial. Except for, as we read Paul's words, the trial doesn't last very long for followers of Jesus, right? Because there's no accusation. Get this, this is how smart I am, I understand this. In order to be found guilty of something, you first have to be accused. And before you can be accused of something, there has to be an accuser. That makes sense, right? I mean, that's basic logic, and that's what Paul's getting at here in Romans. Uh, we see this play out, though, in John chapter 8. You remember John chapter 8 when Jesus is there, and, and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they bring before Jesus this woman who, who's been caught in adultery. Do you remember this? And they remind Jesus, hey, Jesus, in the law of Moses, our, our, our religious law from God, it says that such a woman's supposed to be killed. We need to stone her to death. Now, these men really don't care about this woman or her sin. They're just looking for a way to trap Jesus. Because if he says, go ahead and stone her, well, he's not very loving and gracious. But if he says, no, don't stone her, then he's disobeying the law of Moses, and we can stone him for, for blasphemy, right? So they say, what do you say, Jesus? You tell us. And Jesus thinks about it for a few moments, and he pretty much answers by saying, hey, if there's anyone here who hasn't sinned, Go ahead and kill this woman for her sin. And that's when you, you see all the people who would be accusers, they, they kind of leave one by one, starting with the oldest. They understand. They're just as guilty of sin as this woman. And so then Jesus looks at the woman and says, Hey, is there anyone to accuse you? And she looks around and she answers, I imagine, with grateful tears in her eyes. She said, No, there's no one. So Jesus says, Then I don't judge you. You, know, you see, there's no one to accuse her, so, so he's not going to judge her. In order to be condemned, you have to be accused. And to be accused, there has to be an accuser. So look what Paul writes then in Romans chapter 8, verse 33. Show us, Jim. Show us again, Jim. <laughs> who will bring any charge against you whom God has chosen? It's God who justifies. You know, this is like God's the judge, right? Who's going to bring a, a charge against you there? God's the one who justifies. The rhetorical question is pretty much, who's going to be stupid enough to try to accuse you of something against God? Because God's the one who's already justified. He's the one who's already made justice here. He's the one who's already made you right. God knows justice has been served because he's the one who did it. He did it through his son. It would be pointless to bring an accusation before God for something he's already taken care of. He's not going to go against what he knows to be true, right? He knows you're justified. He's the one who did it. It's like me earlier this week. I was in my kitchen, and I needed a snack, right? Some of my kids are like, what can I have? 
Like, I know. I can have a spoonful of peanut butter, because I'm still a child, I guess, and I do that, right? So I'm like, all right, I get the peanut butter jar out of the cupboard, and I look at the label, and I see that one serving of peanut butter, two tablespoons, has eight grams of carbs. And, and we're on a low-carb diet again, because I'm too irresponsible not to be in a diet, I guess, but we're on this low-carb diet, and I'm thinking, well, that's too many carbs for a snack. Four carbs is doable. So, so half a serving, one tablespoon, I can do. So I, I go and I get a, a spoon out of the drawer at our kitchen, and I, I get about what I think is a tablespoon of peanut butter at the end of the, that spoon. And then two people from my family, who shall remain unnameless, but there were two of them, and, and they come out and they start laughing at me and they start jeering me for eating too many carbs. Like, I just got too many carbs. I said, and I said, no, look, it says right in the label, uh, one tablespoon only has four carbs. Well, you don't know what a tablespoon is. That's way more than a tablespoon. And, and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, all right, because I'm a smart aleck. And I'm in the kitchen. I'm right there. I open the drawer where we keep the measuring spoons. I pull out the tablespoon. And I hand it side by side. Here it is. And you see clearly that this peanut butter would not even fill the space in, in the tablespoon area. I was just like, yeah, I'm right. It was like, I was glad I was right, right? But I, I was right, right? But they keep laughing and jeering. You don't know what you're doing. Don't, don't ever measure anything for me. I'm like, okay, so you know what I did? I ate all that peanut butter. Because I knew, right? I go, we had it there. No matter what they were saying, how much they laughed at me, I knew it wasn't even a full tablespoon. I knew the reality, and I acted in accordance with it. It'll be the same thing on the day of judgment when we stand before God. He knows the reality of our justification, because he's the one who justified us. It doesn't matter what anybody else would say. Should Satan decide at that time to try to bring an accusation against us? He's not going to, but, you know, God knows. It would be pointless for anyone or anything to bring an accusation against us. That's what Paul's getting out here. There's no reason for a follower of Jesus to be afraid of Judgment Day because there's no one who can make an accusation against the justification God has already accomplished for us. The judge knows that justification has already been met because he's the one who did it. But as Paul writes, perhaps that's not enough to comfort people. It's not enough to uh, give them assurance. So Paul goes on to, to another point about this courtroom scene that we kind of picture in our heads as he writes. And he follows it with verse 34. Show us, Jim, who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. The idea is that who, again, who is stupid enough to try to condemn us before God because Jesus is standing right there interceding for us. It says he intercedes, means he's defending. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, John the Apostle says he's our advocate, or meaning that in this courtroom scene on the last day, he is our lawyer. Now, in our culture, lawyers aren't very well respected, are they? You know, we we kind of suspect lawyers, uh, you know, rarely do we ever see them as being truthful or reliable. They're out to cheat people and they just want to get their money, right? Um, in fact, earlier this week, I, I caught the tail end of an episode uh, of Family Feud, right? Family Feud, Steve Harvey is the host, and then they're there they're doing the fast money round, so he's asking these questions real fast. And one of the questions was, name an occupation that is often seen as trying to rip you off. And the guy, he's asking, he has to give an answer real fast, so he says, mechanic. Sorry, for whatever reason, mechanics sometimes do have the, this, this reputation, and whether it's true or not, I don't know, but we think that. And so they're going through the points afterward, and he turn around and you see, for the answer mechanic, he gets 17 points, which isn't a horrible uh, uh, number, but it's not great either. Next person comes out. Steve Harvey asks them, name an occupation that's often seen as trying to rip you off. The guy says doctor, which kind of scares me, because like, oh my gosh, my doctor are trying to rip us off, but all right, so they turn around and he, big old goose egg he gets zero points for that. At which point, Steve Harvey says the number one answer. You know what the number one answer is. Let's do it like we're on Family Feud. You know, when they reveal the answers, everyone says it. Let's do it. The number one answer is. Car dealer. Uh, 
It's lawyer, right? You, you all know, regardless of what you say. All right? It's lawyer because in our culture, lawyers are not seen as dependable. They're not reliable. They're not honest. Uh, Good-natured people, whether they are or not, that's not how they're seen. Even so, if you are accused of something and you are taken for trial before a judge, let's say uh, you are wrongfully accused or you are framed or maybe it was something dumb you did many years ago and you've regretted it ever since and it's caught up with you and, and you're taken for trial, when you're pleading your case before the judge, you want a lawyer, don't you? Even though that we might not respect them in our society, you want one. You're going to want someone standing there as your advocate, interceding on your behalf. As the old saying goes, he who defends himself has a fool for a client. You need representation before the judge. If you follow Jesus then he will be your representation. He will be there interceding on your behalf before Judge God at the great judgment. Paul pretty much asked, now who would be fool enough, foolish enough to stand up against this Jesus to try to condemn you? Uh, because when Jesus is your lawyer, you're not dealing with someone who is a cheat or a liar or unreliable. This is Jesus, as Paul points out. This is Jesus who died. He died to pay the full, pen full penalty for your sins. So he's already, again, he's taken the punishment, and he's the one defending you. He's already paid the punishment. He died for you as God's agent of justification, died so you'd be set free from your sins. Not only did he die, but, but the apostle Paul says, Paul says more than that. More than that, Jesus was raised to life. Resurrection. Jesus' resurrection is proof that death has been swallowed up in victory. It's proof that the justifying work of Christ has been accomplished. And it was enough. It is accepted by God. Jesus being alive means there's no more justification that needs to be made for your sin. That's the guy we have interceding for us at the great judgment. That's Jesus. He's standing between us and anybody else. He's standing right there at the right hand of God as our advocate, pleading our case, as the Apostle John puts it in 1 John 1, 5, or 2, 2, 1. There's no condemnation that can reach us through that guy, right? It's got to go through him first, and he's already taken all the condemnation. That's Jesus. That's the courtroom scene. The judge is on our side, and our lawyer's Jesus. I mean, man, there's no one getting through this. What this means is that if you follow Jesus, no accusation can stand against you for your sin. There can be no condemnation, because the God who justified you, he's the judge. And his son Jesus, God's agent of justification, is your defender and intercessor. You see how God's just rigged the whole thing for us? Right? Therefore, as, we, as we talked about several weeks ago, as Paul introduces uh, chapter 8 of Romans, there can be no condemnation now for those who follow Jesus. It means God is for us rather than against us. The judge is for us. You know, you, you go to trial, you want the judge to be for you because if the judge isn't for you, you're going to have a long haul in, in that, right? But the judge is for us. As Paul puts it in verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And the unwritten answer is no one. No one, no thing. And, and so look what Paul uh, rights will be the outcome of the great judgment for those who follow Jesus. He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? See, rather than being a scary judge who's there to hand down punishment and, and retribution and condemnation, God is the gracious judge. And he, along with Christ, our intercessor, is the one who gives good things, all things. This is a promise, folks, of all things. Every good thing that God has, he will give to us. That is what awaits us on the other side of the great judgment. It means our sanctification and our glorification. I don't know about you, but I think that's all reason kind of look forward to the great judgment. Again, not really wanting to go through the fact that all my sins are laid there before God, but the sentence afterward, the sentencing is glorious. 
And I owe it all to Jesus. We owe it all to Jesus. But there's another side to this. What this means also is that those who don't follow Jesus will stand before Judge Cod and answer for all the good they have done and for all the bad. And because they have not followed Jesus, they are not justified. You know, it's been offered to them, but they've rejected it. So the justification that God would offer them, they don't have. So no justice has been done on their behalf for the bad, for the sins that they have committed. And so they will stand before the judge who is not their justifier. And as they stand before that great judge, they will have no intercessor. They will have no advocate. So they will be found guilty. And the sentence for guilt before Judge God is an eternity separated from Him, which is what they've kind of been wanting and choosing all along. They, they didn't want to be with God, right? So He gives that to them. But what they don't realize is that an eternity without God is an eternity in hell, an eternity of endless agony, endless suffering. It's very real. And they may not recognize that now. But they will immediately recognize that at the great judgment. And then it will be too late. There is a world of people out there for whom this is their destiny. They have chosen not to follow Jesus. They don't know because no one's told them or no one's told them clearly or they don't fully understand that only Jesus can save them. Only Jesus can justify them and defend them. Right, they're out there. Who have you told about this lately is the question. Who have you told? Of those who have resisted the message, who have you reminded of this lately? Because dare we lavish in the graciousness of our God without sharing it. I mean, how evil is that? I know in a church this size, we like to think, oh, we know everyone. We know everyone's Christian. Everyone follows you. Everyone believes in Jesus. Everyone's going to heaven. But we can't know everyone's heart. So, so hey, maybe there's someone out there who, who hasn't followed Jesus. And if that's you, if you're among those who, as of yet, do not follow Jesus today, don't, don't wait another moment. Confess that you're a sinner needing a Savior. And then ask Jesus into your life. And follow Him. Live your life for Him instead of living for yourself. Live His way now instead of your way. And you will be justified by God through Christ. And Christ will be your intercessor. He will be your advocate. He will be your defender. He will be your salvation. So that for you, like it is for me, the result of the great judgment will not be fear, will not be agony, but it will be glorious. It's going to be glorious for all of us who follow Christ. The sharing of all the good things that God offers us forever. Let's pray.